بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الانبیاء و سید المرسلین و على آلہ و اصحابہ الغر المیمین و من تبعہم بے احسان الى یوم الدین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ السمیع العلیم من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم و ما ارسلناک الا رحمت للعالمین و قال رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم بلغو عنی ولو آیا Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, thank you very much for attending this important lecture. I will be talking about Aurangzeb Alamgir. And he was a Mughal emperor who governed from the year 1658 to 1707, almost 49 years. Um, and he is a very controversial figure in this current day and age, in particular in India and in general within the Western academia. And there's a reason for that. The reason is, in India he's controversial because the right, Hindu right, the Hindu right-wing parties, uh, specifically the one in power right now, BJP, has made it a business for itself to tarnish Aurangzeb Alamgir because he is seen as a very Muslim king. And because of his strong attachment to Islam, which we find in historical sources. He has been demonized beyond uh, historical narratives. And some modern historians have challenged that narrative. In fact, recently, a historian from the US called Audrey Trusk, uh, and she is a lady, she has written this very important book titled Aurangzeb the life and legacy of India's most controversial king. This was published in uh, 2017. Uh, it is the most recent work on the life of Aurangzeb Alamgir and it, it is very brief. You will not find details in this book. Uh, the book is about 108 pages long if we minus the notes and the bibli uh, bibliography of the book. Uh, it is a very good narrative. It gives you a summary of the life of Aurangzeb Alamgir and some of the controversies uh, have been discussed in this book. So what are the controversies about Aurangzeb Alamgir? Why is he so important in uh, today's India and internationally? Uh, why is he so important? He's important because he is seen as a bigot, a religious bigot who was demolishing temples, Hindu temples, who was persecuting uh, Hindus. He has he had an anti-Hindu policy and this is these are the claims, these are the charges against him. I'm repeating the charges. And we will see whether these charges are actually uh, historically tenable or they can be sustained uh, in the light of historical narrative uh, available to us today. So Aurangzeb Alamgir is controversial for these reasons. He is accused of persecuting Sikhs. In fact, there is no doubt one of the Sikh Gurus, the ninth Guru, uh, sorry, the eighth Guru, eighth Sikh Guru uh, was um, um, no, sorry, it was the ninth Guru. The Guru Teg Bahadur was killed in 1675 um, by the orders of Aurangzeb Alamgir. So even Sikhs don't like him. So, why is this king so important? Despite the fact that India was the most powerful country in the world during his reign, 24 percent of the world's GDP, in other words, world's economy or money was in India at the time when Aurangzeb was governing. This was the peak of the Indian civilization when the Indians had become the richest and the most powerful people in the world. Although India had little influence outside, but within the Indian subcontinent, the Mughals were, uh, were very, very powerful. So we will look into these charges, whether Aurangzeb was actually a religious bigot or whether he was actually out to destroy all the temples uh, in India, whether he was a persecutor of the Sikhs, whether he was someone who deliberately marger, ma, marginalized Hindus from power or from the straight apparatus. We will look into all these charges very quickly. First about the man himself. Who was he? He was a Mughal emperor, born in 1618 to Shah Jahan and his favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal. 
Have you all heard about Taj Mahal? Right? One of the most famous visited site in India. India, when it is advertised globally, you have to see one image that comes to screens very often. And that image is the image of the Taj Mahal, the famous Taj Mahal. Um, Taj Mahal is a tomb made by the Emperor Shah Jahan for his beloved wife, uh, uh, Mumtaz Mahal, who was the mother of Aurangzeb. So together they had nearly 14 children, uh, Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal. That, that shows uh, the relationship they had. They had a very strong relationship and they were uh, in love deeply. And Shah Jahan uh, was uh, devastated when his wife died and he was so devastated that he was hardly seen in public for many months after the death of his beloved wife. And then he paid a lavish tribute to his wife by building this monument called the Taj Mahal, which is visited by many people to this day. So Aurangzeb was the son of that very woman. He was the third son born to Shah Jahan. And there were other sons born, of course. In total, there were four. Dara Shukuh was the eldest. Then there was Shah Shuja, who was the second son. Aurangzeb Alamgi was the third son. And then there was a fourth son called uh, Murad. So these are four sons of the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan was the son of Jahangir. Jahangir was the son of uh, Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar. And Akbar was the son of Humayun. And Humayun was the son of Babur, who was the first Mughal Emperor. Babur came from Central Asia. I don't want to go into the history of the Mughal um, invasions into India or how the Mughals started in the first place and who the Mughals were and where they came from and their, uh, their background history because that will be a lecture in itself. I'm talking about Aurangzeb today. So I will give you a very brief background history on the Mughals. Thank you. So the Mughals originated from Central Asia and Babur was the ruler of Samarkand and Bukhara. And he was driven into Afghanistan by other Uzbek tribes. And then he thought of invading India. He invaded India in 1526, cut the long story short. And he defeated the Muslim king of India at the time called Ibrahim Lodi. Ibrahim Lodi was defeated, uh, even though he outnumbered uh, Babur's army by far. Uh, Babur's archers and his, his guns outgunned Ibrahim Lodi's army and he came to power in 1526. He only lived for four years after that and in 1530 he died having left uh, India and uh, he didn't like India much. He was uh, from Central Asia, he liked the weather of Central Asia, he liked the people of Central Asia. When he came to India he found it to be very hot, dusty and he specifically writes that the people of India uh, are not as good looking as the people of Central Asia. So he had this prejudice against the, the Indian people. So Babur was definitely an outsider, no doubt. But then after he died, his son came to power, Hamayun, who was an opium addict, to say the least, and um, was not a very strong king. He governed for 10 years and then uh, um, uh, an Afghan general called Sher Khan, also known as Sher Shah, the Lion King, literally translated, and his name was Farid Khan. He's not the Lion King of um, Disneyland, by the way. <laughs> okay, so, but he was the Mufasa of India uh, for at least five years. Uh, he governed India with an iron fist. He was a very strong administrator. I I'm talking about Sher Shah Suri. And um, he built many monuments, he built roads, he established the postal system, he established many uh, sarai. Sarai are, were the resting places for travelers uh, across the empire. So he was a very, very effective leader. And if he had not been killed by an accident um, in one of the campaigns uh, in India, then he would have ruled for a very long time and he would have been a very powerful leader indeed. But within five years, Sher Shah's reign was over and then his sons came to power. Islam Shah Suri and Salim Shah and Adil Shah and these people, they all fought each other for another 10 years. And having ruled for 15 years, almost 16 years, uh, the Suris were ousted by Humayun because Humayun who had taken refuge in Iran when he had to leave India, when uh, this general called Sher Shah had rebelled against the Mughals. So by the help of the Persian emperor, 
at the time uh, Humayun was able to come back and uh, take the land of India back from the Suris. So he was re-established in India. And the year was 1555. So he only governed for a few months when he fell from the stairs of his library and died. So there was an accident in the library. He slipped from the stairs and he died. And Akbar, his son, Muhammad Akbar, was 13 at the time. So he had to take the burden of the empire and he became the Mughal emperor. And because he was a child, he was very fragile. Other people governed on his behalf until he was an adult or until he was actually able to rule India. And when he became uh, an adult or when he became uh, of age, he removed all the other uh, people who were governing on his behalf and he took direct control. In the beginning, he was a very religious man. He was praying five times a day. He was actually uh, cleaning the, uh, the mosques and he was a very humble man. He would pick up the slippers of ulama and put them uh, in front of the ulama so that they can wear them. He, this is the kind of, per, kind of person he was initially. But he was illiterate. Unfortunately, uh, because of the turmoil, uh, in his early life, the political turmoil he faced because of the fugitive uh, uh, years of his father and because he was also, also he was born in exile, uh, he couldn't be educated properly like a proper Mughal uh, king or prince. So because of this illiteracy, he always relied on others to give him information. Cut the long story short, um, he kind of drifted away from Islam because he saw the character and the behavior of the ulama at the time to be very repulsive. Um, he found some of the ulama, of course, ulama su, they were not ulama, uh, you know, ulama haq, as we say. They were obviously after money and power and influence and they were misbehaving. Uh, Akbar had made uh, a center for debates. It was called Ibadat Khana in his palace and he would get the ulama and people from other religions to come and have debates in this center. So when he saw these debates, all of these people were misbehaving, they were cursing each other, they were insulting each other, like a lot of people do nowadays. Um, I don't know if you remember this program that used to come on Pakistani channels, especially in Ramadan, this guy called Amir Liaqat. He has five or six uh, ulama sitting next to each other. And they are debating each other and they are using very foul language at times and they are swearing at each other. And you know, when I was watching this program, even last Ramadan, what came to my mind was Akbar's Ibadat Khana, where Akbar would have these ulama debate each other and they would misbehave, they would use uh, foul language. And because of that, Akbar was put off Islam. And likewise, there are people uh, with little knowledge of Islam, with weak hearts, with weak incl inclination towards Islam, they could be easily influenced in places like Pakistan when watching these programs, ulama bickering with each other in that foul manner. So Akbar had eventually abandoned Islam. I'm not giving you the details. These are very, very brief, scanty, uh, uh, you know, anecdotal things I'm sharing with you from the life of these Mughal emperors. For the details, chunky volumes have been written on them. You can go and look at the details. So Akbar had initiated his own religion. In other words, he had apostatized from Islam. His religion was called deen e ilahi He said, if, the, if this is the best Islam has to offer, I don't want it. Okay, so he said, I will initiate my own religion because he had arrogance and he had some funny advisors who made him think that he was somehow divine. One of them was a man called Abul Fazl who had brainwashed him to an extent that he, Akbar started to think that he had divine powers. So he initiated his own religion. Then he died in 1605. And then his son Jahangir came to power who had to reassert his Islamic identity. He had to disown his father, at least in religious uh, ideology and he insisted that his father repented on deathbed and there's no evidence for that but Jahangir had to reassert his Islamic identity but he was also a drunkard Jahangir was mostly drunk and uh, he was of course every Mughal emperor inherited problems rebellions uh, wars uh, and uh, financial issues so he had ministers taking care of all of that and uh, he um, died very young a lot of these Mughal emperors would die very young because uh, they would consume opium as an aphrodisiac and they had, uh, a, they had large harams filled with women from all parts of the world and their major pastime would be living with these women and spending time with them and they would take opium excessively and many of them died for this reason very young. 
in the 40s and 50s or oh, uh, hardly any, any any of them made uh, made, made it to 60 <laughs> but aurangzeb was an exception as we will see um, so jahangir died in 1627 and his son shah jahan came to power and shah jahan governed for nearly 30 years again this is not a history of shah jahan you can go to books to study about shah jahan whose reign was a very powerful reign that was the peak of the Mughal Empire. The Mughal Empire had reached its peak financially, civilizationally, educationally, um, in terms of culture and literature. Uh, this was a very rich uh, era during uh, the Indian history. In fact, India never existed as a nation until the Mughals made it one. This is something the Indian nationalists those who hate the Mughals owe to the Mughals. Those Hindu nationalists today, or fundamentalists, or extremists, who are uh, very uneducated people in most cases, and that includes the Prime Minister of India currently, the one who is Prime Minister, uh, Narendra Modi, is actually an illiterate man, uh, and his voters... So he's the Trump of India, and now you can imagine what I mean by that. Okay, uh, look at the Trump voters in in the U.S. and look at uh, uh, Modi voters in India. There will be uh, a lot of similarities there. So these people they hate the Mughals with a passion, just because Mughals are Muslims, and they don't know much about Mughal history. And anyone who wants to uh, put the record straight and clarify the history, they start hating those people with a passion. So Indian nationalists owe the identity to the Mughals because Mughals made India as a united entity for the first time previous to the Mughal organization of Indian states into one body India was uh, made of a number of different dynasties different states different ethnicities for example Rajputs they had their own region and they had their own governments. Then we had the Marathas in the south. Uh, before the Marathas, there were Cholas and Vijayanagar, and there were other empires that governed. And then in the Dakkan region, there were two other Muslim dynasties, although Shia, they were Bijapur and Golconda. They, they were, so Mughal India was scattered. It were the Mughals, and in particular Aurangzeb, that united India as one entity, as one nation. So there was no India before the Mughals. There was a land called Hind, no doubt. The outsiders referred to India as Hind. But Hind had no set boundaries, no set definition. It could, mean, it could easily mean Northern India. It could mean Northern India. So, coming back to Shah Jahan. So Shah Jahan in 15... Uh, sorry, 1657, uh, became ill and there was a Mughal tradition of the emperor when he would be in the capital, he would show himself on the, on the balcony of the palace for the people to see him. So when people would see him, they would know the emperor is well and they would pray for his well-being. So in 15, 50, sorry, 1657, September, in the month of September, Shah Jahan got ill. And he did not appear on the Jaroka. It was called Jaroka, the, 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 the balcony. And people assumed that the emperor is dead. And he didn't appear for the next 10 days. So that strengthened, strengthened the rumor. The rumor spread to the sons. Now, the Mughal emperors would definitely at times uh, recommend or have um, someone to succeed them. Right, they would have their favorites. For example, in this case, the favorite of Shah Jahan was his eldest son called Dara Shuku. Dara Shuku was um, a, a very um, free thinker in the sense that he did not really see Islam as other ulama saw it. Right, so he was more like Akbar. People, the ulama at the time in India. They feared Dara Shuku because he was a free thinker, not in the sense as we know the term today, because today free thinker means something different. Free thinker at that, that time meant that this person could be a Muslim, 
He could be a non-Muslim or he could be convinced by any other uh, alien philosophy. For example, the Hindu philosophy. So he would mix with uh, Sufis, he would mix with the Hindu uh, uh, yogis and the pundits and the Brahmins and he would be learning their philosophies and he would uh, try to mix them up. So he actually wrote a text called Majma al Bahrain. Majma al Bahrain literally trans translated means the meeting of the two seas. In this book, he argued that Hinduism and Islam is actually the same. They come from the same source. So they are pretty much the same religions because they teach very similar things. So when he wrote this book, the, the ulama of India became very vigilant and they were against the idea of him succeeding his father as the emperor. Because if he, if he succeeded, then India would become another India of Akbar. When Akbar governed, when he initiated his own religion, Deen Ilahi, as I mentioned earlier, he started to persecute the ulama who opposed him. In fact, some of the ulama, they called him Dalaluddin Akbar. You know, his name was Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar, the name that was given to him at birth. But some of the ulama, they started to call him Dalaluddin, the guidance, sorry, the misguidance, the misguidance of the deen, Akfar. Akfar means the, the biggest disbeliever in India. So some of the ulama actually declared him to be a disbeliever. So they were worried if Dara Shukur came to power after his father, he would possibly do the same thing. He would start to persecute the ulama who would not agree with him. And, uh, and a lot of the Indian nationalists nowadays, or a lot of the Western academics, they think that Dara Shukur was a liberal you know, as you know the term liberal today, okay? As you know the term liberal today. Let me clarify something. No one was liberal before the rise of liberalism in the world. No one was truly liberal. If we were to ap apply current liberal values to pre-modern kings or early modern kings anywhere in the world, whether they were in Europe, whether they were in Asia, whether they were in uh, Africa, wherever they may be, they were not liberals. They were simply kings trying to live their lives by their own standards. They were trying to be kings. And likewise, Mughals were kings in their own times. They fulfilled the requirements of the times. There was no liberalism then. There, was, there were no human rights then. And there were no human rights organizations like Amnesty International. And uh, there was no one or no organization to overlook uh, r laws and rules for nations like the United Nations and things like that, or uh, Geneva, Geneva Convention. Of course, we, they had Islam. There were some who adhered to Islam. They followed Islam and Islamic principles, Islamic rights of humans and animals and others, right? There were others who did not follow those rules. So, Dara Shuku was no, not a liberal by any stretch of imagination. He was a Mughal prince who would have done exactly the same what Aurangzeb did later on. So now Dara Shuku, being the eldest son and the favorite, and for that reason Shah Jahan kept him very close to himself in, um, within the court in Agra and Delhi. That was, the, I mean, Delhi was the capital, Agra was um, also a very important center of the Mughals close to Delhi. So Dara Shuku was not a general, he was not trained as a general, he was a man of books. He was a man of philosophy, he was a thinker, he would spend a lot of time with thinkers of different uh, persuasions and he would be writing books. But on the other hand, Aurangzeb, who was disliked by his father, Shah Jahan, was thrown away into the empire at a very young age. So he was sent to Deccan when he was 18. Aurangzeb was born in 1618 and in 1636 um, he was sent away to Deccan to fight the wars of his father. So at a very young age, Aurangzeb was thrown in to the thick of the battle. And because of that, he became a trained general. He knew the ins and outs of war. He was a military man. He was on the battlefield non-stop. And he was a very diligent military man. Very astute. He learned the military skills and the arts of diplomacy uh, that was required in India at the time. He knew who was who and where he needs to do what. He had all these ideas. So when Dara Shuku had realized that Aurangzeb has become 
a very powerful military general who and at the same time remember Aurangzeb was a religious man unlike Dara Shakur religious man in the sense that he was very close to the ulama and he demonstrated ability to uphold and support orthodoxy in India rather than some kind of heretical ideas like Dara Shakur was seen uh, by the ulama uh, to be supporting so that's why the ulama they put their weight behind Aurangzeb they wanted Aurangzeb to come to power after Shah Jahan dies Dara Shakur did not like his younger brother and uh, continued to conspire against him in many ways when Aurangzeb would be close to a victory he would simply pull away the army he would get his father to uh, basically send orders to withdraw when Aurangzeb would be very close to victory so Aurangzeb knew who was pulling the strings it was his elder brother who was influencing the father to uh, set policies against Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb had corresponded with his father extensively and he had complained to his father about his uh, impossible situations but uh, Shah Jahan simply didn't like his son Aurangzeb and always found reasons to dislike him even though Aurangzeb was a very obedient son. There is this book I recommend strongly to everyone. Uh, the title of the book is Aurangzeb and his times and it is written by Zahiruddin Faruqi, an Indian scholar, and it is, it's, it's, it is full of information, information that you may not find in Audrey Trusk's book, uh, because this book is very brief, it's short and straight to the point, and it deals with major controversies about Aurangzeb's, lives, uh, Aurangzeb's life. But this one is a lot more extensive, has more, a lot more details. Aurangzeb and his times, Zahiruddin Faruqi, who has penned this book, and he has a lot of these letters, Aurangzeb, wrote to his father to convince him uh, to be uh, to um, to be just to him cut the long story short when Shah Jahan had become ill and people thought he had died Aurangzeb um, was told that the king is dead so was Murad so was Shah Shuja uh, Shuja was the governor of Bengal Murad was in Gujarat Indian Gujarat and Dara Shikoo was at the court and Aurangzeb was in Dakkan. So these four sons were in uh, different places uh, staged differently. Now amazingly, some people when they read history of the Mughals, they look at these brothers at each other's throat. They think that these Mughals had no morality. They had no love for their blood. For this reason you will find the Mughals killing their relatives very often. The Ottomans were doing the same thing, right? Sometimes we have these perceptions of angelic beings governing these states and we turn them into saints. Like Audrey Trush talks about it, that there are two extremes about Mughal emperors, in particular about Aurangzeb, that the Muslims of India, India see him as a saint, right? And the Hindus of India see him as the devil incarnate. They see him as the sinner, right? So... And the, the truth is in the middle. He was neither a saint nor a sinner. He was just a king trying to govern his state to the best of his ability. Of course, he had uh, his own views on religion. He was a very religious man, as we will see in due course. He implemented these uh, policies which he saw as justice in India. And personally, he was a very pious man. This is why we are talking about Aurangzeb, not any other Mughal emperor, because he was the most Islamic king or the Muslim king out of all the Mughal emperors. He was responsible for a lot of Islamic projects, as I will talk about in due course, inshallah ta'ala. So, when Shah Jahan was ill, Aurangzeb heard about this. So, he knew Dara Shuku, if he comes to power, who was in the capital, he would not only execute Murad and Shuja, his two other brothers, he would happily execute Aurangzeb because he is the one who was um, sabotaging all the activities of Aurangzeb and causing him problems and troubles. So, what happened? Dara Shuku, he started to conspire. He started to build an army so that he can face his brothers. He knew his brothers will come. They will come and contest the throne. Now, Shah Jahan uh, had not died. He was still alive and he recovered from his illness. 
but the damage was done. The armies were already on the move. Aurangzeb left from Dakkan, Murad left from Gujarat, and Shuja started to prepare also. So Aurangzeb and Murad, cut the long story short, met each other and they decided that uh, Murad will become the king. Aurangzeb is simply fighting to protect his life and his family. And the point I was make, going to make earlier that these brothers, some, someone thinks, how can they fight wars with each other and kill each other like that and be so, so ruthless? And decline of a Mughal prince was not only decline of one man, it was the decline of his entire entourage that consisted of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people. If a Mughal prince was moving with his army, it, it would be a moving city. In fact, one of the European observers called Thomas Rowe observed the entourage of Jahangir when he was moving with his army. So it, it would take 24 hours from one point, on one point for the entire Mughal army to pass that point. Does that make sense? For the Mughal army to pass one point, it would take 24 hours. The caravan would be as long as 10 miles. It would consist of shops, markets, people selling meat, cloth, pots, spices, food, uh, you know, all the necessities, weapons, you name it, it would be a moving city. It would be a moving New York, put it this way, or moving London, imagine that, right? It would be a city on the move. So, um, these princes, they had uh, states, they were governing. These provinces, they, were, they ran into hundreds of thousands of squares of miles, and they were very powerful, they had a lot of money. So, demise of one prince would mean the demise of his entire entourage. So, that's why his party, wives, children, generals, soldiers, supporters would support them till the end. So, these armies were on the move. So, Murad and Aurangzeb, they met each other and they decided that Murad would become king and Aurangzeb would take some governorship. But they have to confront Dara Shaku. Dara Shaku is the problem. He is the, he is the common enemy of us all, the, the, the eldest brother, who was seen as a heretic. They actually called him a kafir. They actually referred to him as the, as, as the kafir. Okay? In correspondence with each other, and there are, there's a historical record available where the princes, these three princes, referred to him as, as, the, as the, the murtad, basically, because he had expressed s such ideas in his writings and his books. So no one wanted him in power, at least not these princes. So cut the long story short, uh, there was a battle that took place between Dara Shaku's armies and these two brothers. Dara Shaku was defeated, he went back to Agra. And then another battle took place between Aurangzeb and Dara Shaku uh, at a place called Samugar. And Aurangzeb was victorious and Dara Shaku was on the run. And he was on the run for nearly two years. He... Um, was running through the jungles of Punjab, Gujarat and places like Rajasthan. Cut the long story short, he was betrayed by one of the people he had saved in the past, one of the, the, the chiefs uh, at the border of Afghanistan. He was trying to cross into Persia because the Persian emperor had offered him refuge. So he was caught at the border and sent back to Delhi and Aurangzeb uh, got him paraded on top of an elephant uh, and humiliated him publicly and executed him for apostasy. Or for heresy. So Dara Shaku was out of the way. Now he turned to his other brothers, Murad and Shuja. Murad was, cut the long story short, rep uh, arrested by Aurangzeb's uh, um, strategy. Uh, Aurangzeb knew until so long as these two brothers are alive, um, they will not let him govern in peace. There was a principle among the Mughal princes. There was a principle. And it was stated in Farsi, in the Persian lang language. It was, Ya Takht, Ya Tabut. Who would like to translate that for me? Does anyone understand? The throne or the coffin. This is how the Mughal princes thought. When the father died, everyone would try his luck. Whether it was a grandson or a son of the emperor. And these men could be in the 60s or 70s at the time when the father died, like it happened with Aurangzeb. When he died, three of his sons fought each other. 
so Mughals didn't have a system in place to appoint a successor. They would let the Mughal princes fight out their differences, right? And the one who was to be victorious would take the throne. And this is how it happened with uh, Jahangir, and this is how Shah Jahan came to power. Shah Jahan had to execute one of his brothers, Dawar Baksh. Jahangir likewise poisoned, uh, allegedly, one of his brothers called Daniyal to come to power. And now it was Aurangzeb's turn, Dara Shaku was out of the way. Now he arrested Murad by uh, um, uh, deceiving him into uh, a meeting. Uh, he was deceived to come and meet and discuss differences and then he was arrested uh, and he was executed in due course uh, later on. And Shuja uh, found uh, uh, safety in running away. So Shuja actually made his way to Burma, current day Burma, Myanmar, and it is thought that he was killed off by local chiefs there. So Aurangzeb in 1658 became the king. He became the king. So who is this man Aurangzeb? Why is he so important? Why are the Hindu nationalists in India so against him? Why is he so controversial? As I said, one of the reasons is that he was a very dedicated Muslim. Aurangzeb was a very strong Muslim. And when he came to power for the, ten, for the first 10 years of his power, he kept things as they were in the time of Shah Jahan. There was music at the court, wine drinking was allowed, and other things were happening. But 10 years after he came to power, he started to ban all these things. And he removed many of the Mughal traditions that were there. For example, Mughal dignitaries, when they would come to the court, they would actually bow in front of the king, and it was called Cornish. They would actually say salam, you know, they would make a gesture with their hand three times, bow to, uh, to acknowledge the superiority of the king, the emperor. He removed that practice. He said it's haram to bow to another man. He removed it. He was uh, supported by ulama. There were ulama advising him. Uh, he had the company of the ulama. In fact, he memorized the Quran after he became the emperor, amazingly. He memorized the entire Quran after he became the emperor. Can you imagine a person becoming the emperor? You know, when you become, generally, usually what happened with the Mughal, when someone became the emperor, all hell was, uh, you know, uh, broke, broken loose. They would just go and attack the women, you know, in the harem, and they would start drinking, and they would start having parties, and they would ha hardly care for the state affairs. But in this case, it reversed. When he came to power, Previously, Aurangzeb was just a standard Mughal prince. He possibly was involved in, you know, he never used to drink, by the way, but he had his singing parties and all of that, and, you know, that was that went with the Mughal. But when he became king, he re realized he has a responsibility now. This empire is upon his shoulders. So he has to be a good Muslim, and he has to be a good king, and thirdly, he has to be a good Muslim king. So these were his um, motives initially, which were clearly stated in, in his letters. And he would often rebuke his generals and his sons who would be governing on his behalf in different regions to do justice, even with the Hindus. Do not harass Brahmins. Do not push them around. Facilitate things for them. Okay, If Hindu pilgrims are coming to the temples, let them do it. He removed all the taxes imposed on the Hindus and the pilgrim sites uh, imposed by previous emperors. He removed them. If anything, Aurangzeb actually was more pro-Hindu than all the Mughal emperors put together. Ironically, the Hindutva movement in India, for some reason, hates this man uh, wrongfully. They are actually doing injustice to him. If they study his history carefully, as Audrey Trashk has shown in this book, that Aurangzeb, if anything, he was more lenient towards the Hindus than all the Mughal emperors put together before him. Because before him, the, the, uh, the average of Hindu mansabdars, mansab is basically governorship or a position in the state. So 23% percent uh, dignitaries within the Mughal state were Hindus. They had powerful positions. They were generals. They were governors, Hindus. They were finance ministers. They had ministries because they were effective ministers, right? 
So, Aurangzeb's time, the number grew to, grew to 31%, more than, more than half of what he uh, inherited. So he had supported uh, Hindus because of their abilities. In fact, uh, he remembered one of his finance ministers uh, until he died. Uh, his name was Ragunatha. Uh, Ragunatha was his finance minister only for five years, but Aurangzeb remembered him until the day he died. Until 1707, Aurangzeb would mention him and he would, he would say, I wish I had him today with me because he was such an effective uh, finance minister. He took care of finances effectively. So, um, all these accusations against him that he was an anti-Hindu king because he was a strong Muslim are false. So, this is the easiest target the Hindus extremist or Hindu right-wing parties in India, Bajrang Dal, BJP and Shiv Sena and all these people, they have made a narrative. You must have heard now in India that Muslims can be attacked anywhere in the rural areas, not in the cities, uh, sp specifically speaking. In the rural areas, Muslims are being persecuted. So many videos have come out, I've seen them myself, where Muslims are being beaten by Hindu mobs and the police is doing nothing. Mosques are being attacked. Right? And if someone's caught trading in cows, selling cows or buying cows, slaughtering is out of the question, they would kill him. Reports have come out, people have been killed for trading in cows. And amazingly, under this current government of India, which is a Hindu right-wing nationalist government, uh, just like the Nazis, right? Under this current government, India is one of the largest beef exporters in the world, ironically. It doesn't make sense. Yani if Muslims slaughter a cow, it's a crime. Death penalty, on the spot. Mob justice. But if the government does it to bring in money, billions of dollars, then it's okay. This is the point one of the Muslim leaders in India, known as Asaduddin Awaisi, from he's a leader, upcoming leader uh, from Hyderabad, and he's a he's a very vocal leader of the Muslims, and he had he has raised these points uh, on media as well, Indian media, and he's he is seen as a bogeyman as well. He is a villain to the Hindutva movement or the right wing Hindu nationalist extremist movement because he speaks the haq, he speaks the truth, he tells them, them he shows them the mirror. And this is the point he raised, that you kill people for owning cows if they are Muslim, but your government is one of the largest ex exporters of beef in the world. Why are you selling... So, so if people eat cows outside of India, it is not blasphemy. You cannot eat cows inside India. That's the point he was making. So these are the people who hate anyone who had a strong attachment with Islam in Indian history. There are two individuals in particular that are hated by right-wing Hindu extremists in India. One is Aurangzeb Alangir for his strong attachment to Islam and Muslims. I do apologize for the time uh, because we started late. So we will pray Isha inshallah very soon. I will take a few more minutes to end and then we'll pray Isha inshallah ta'ala after that. Yes, I know. Uh, we are Sorry, what's the time now? Plenty of time. Plenty of time. Sorry, I thought that was 7.42. Okay, that's 17.42. Okay. So we have plenty of time. Okay, sorry. So I can continue. I can tell you about Babar, Mayun, Akbar, and Shah Jahan. Yeah. Okay. So, are you getting bored, brothers and sisters? Maybe this is too much information to take in one day. But you can go and watch this lecture again. It will be edited. It will be professionally uploaded, and you can, inshallah, find it online after a few days, and you can listen to the the dates and the facts and the names again, inshallah, taala. So. These people hate these two kings in particular for their attachment to Islam. There is no other reason. I'll tell you why there's no other reason. Because they were no different to other kings in India. In their wars, in the appointment or dismissal of Hindus, depending on what the reasons were, in their policies on temples and mosques, in their policies on Islam and Hinduism, uh, in their policy in crushing rebellions, Aurangzeb and Tipu Sultan, who is the second figure, are no different to other kings in India. The other person, the Hindu right-wing extremist uh, elements hate is a man called Tipu Sultan, 
who was also a very strong Muslim, had a very strong attachment to Islam and wanted the rise of Islam in India once again. He wanted the rise of Muslim civilization in India once again. And remember this, brothers and sisters, every time Muslims governed India, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect. Never do we claim a utopia in India. We don't. But we do claim that when the Muslims governed India from the period uh, that dates back to the 13th century, the Delhi Sultanate period when the Turkic rulers came into India and they governed, and up to the Mughal period, Hindus, Muslims, Jains, Christians when they came about, and even Sikhs lived together in peace so long as all people wanted peace. Muslims governed all these people and gave them positions in the state, important positions, and governed them despite all the differences. But every time Hindus came to power, I'm not talking about Hindus today in India because Hindu, Hindus, Hindu can mean anything. In fact, Audrey Trusk, she raises a very interesting point that the term Hindu doesn't even appear in the Mughal chronicles. It is either Marathas, Rajputs or other nations. They are referred to uh, not as Hindus but by their nations or by their tribes or by their, uh, by their regions. Because even Hindus were divided. There was no uh, homogeneity, homogeneity what's the word? Um, Hindus were not homogeneous. They were not monolithic. Rather, they were diverse people with diverse beliefs, diverse ethnicities, diverse uh, ideas. So for that reason, this new idea called the Hindu nationalism, again, is a new thing. It's a modern thing. It's a modern phenomenon which is full of Islamophobia, xenophobia and extremism. And people talk about the Taliban and people talk about ISIS in some cases rightly so because, because these people were persecuting others. But what's happening in India in some cases is far worse than what ISIS and Taliban were doing. In fact, some of the Hindu extremists are doing worse things to Muslims than ISIS were doing to others. I'm making this claim boldly. There's no difference between them, if anything. There's no difference. So, why not call them to account? If the world media was crying, you know, for example, if people were talking about ISIS, rightly so, and condemning the atrocities, rightly so, which we all condemn, what they were doing wrong, right? And when they were persecuting people, rightly so, why isn't the global media crying similarly about what the Hindu extremists are doing in, or what the Buddhist extremists are doing in Burma? So there is some double standard, you know, uh, and this double standard is actually global, it's widespread. It is found in academia, it is found in political circles, it is found in economic circles, it is found in literary circles. Don't make a mistake, don't make any mistakes. It is there, it is real. Okay, and that's why it finds support. Islamophobia is a multi billion dollars industry. Islamophobia industry spends millions of dollars on spreading Islamophobia, right? So, for this reason, some people were attacking this woman, this lady, for doing her job. She's a historian. She's a trained historian, Audrey Trusk. She wrote this book and she made her life difficult. She's being attacked daily on Twitter, on social media. And Islamophobes in the US, people like Robert Spencer, who runs a website called the Jihad Watch, is attacking her on Twitter for doing history. She's a historian. She's a trained historian who knows Persian and Sanskrit. She has written history as, as she sees it. And she was yesterday, or the day before yesterday, she delivered a lecture in India, in Chennai. And she was heckled from the crowd. Of course, a lot of people supported her. They applauded her as well. There are many uh, liberal, sane-minded, moderate Hindus in India who don't want this to happen, what's happening to Muslims. There are many good Hindus, I would say, in India who don't want Muslims to be killed and persecuted. So they support uh, people like Audrey Trusk and scholars who are doing objective work. But there are others. Now, she also tweeted today that outside 
um, a venue where she was uh, due to speak, there is police and people are being searched. And she said, this shouldn't be happening. This shouldn't be happening with scholars. We are scholars. We have opinions and we should be free to express our opinions. We shouldn't be threatened um, um, with death and all that. So coming back to the issue of brothers. So Mughal princes, they were brothers, of course. And there was a reason why they were so um, cold towards each other. And let me explain why. Because when they were born, they were put under training. They were given military training. They were given basic education. And when they had reached their teenage, they were sent to the battlefield to prove their worth. So... These brothers had no attachment. You know, like nowadays, you people live in your houses and you may have siblings, right? Yes, brothers and sisters? Yes, you may have siblings and you have very strong relationship with them. You, you know your sister, you know your brother, you see them every day, right? You, you, you have a laugh with them, you go out eating with them, you enjoy your time with them, right? You know them. But these Mughal princes, poor souls, as soon as they hit teenage, they would be sent to Gujarat. One is gone to Gujarat. One is gone to Bengal. One is gone to Deccan. And they wouldn't see each other for years. So they had no attachment with each other. And they had this assumption. It was already there that once the, the father, the emperor dies, we will be at each other's throat because all of them will have to fight it out. And it wasn't only about becoming an emperor, it was actually about saving your life. Because once you have lost the battle, you will die anyway. Because your brother who may come to power will pursue you until you're dead. So this was a battle for princes. As far as the princes were concerned, this was a battle of life and death. So it wasn't as simple as these killers, these murderers killing each other. You know, they were so selfish, so bad, so evil. They were just killing each other. No, it were the times they were living in. It were the traditions they had inherited. They had no other choice. They had to fight it out to protect their families and their lives. So it, it wasn't only about becoming an emperor. It was fighting for your lives. This is why your takht, your tabut. Either it is the throne or it is the coffin. One of these two. There is no third option for a Mughal prince once the father is dead. And this is exactly what happened with these four princes. So when Aurangzeb was about to execute Dara Shuku, when he was brought to his court in Delhi, Aurangzeb asked him, what would you do if you were in my place? He asked his elder brother who had lost the battle, lost the war, because as I said, Dara Shuku was a man of books. He was not a man of the field. Aurangzeb was the battle-hardened man of the field who had fought major battles in Indian history. In fact, he was so dedicated to his deen and to his work that during one of the campaigns in Afghanistan, um, within the battlefield, uh, the time for Salah came and he dismounted his horse and he started to pray in the thick of the battle, in the middle of the battle, when arrows cannonballs and swords and shields and spears are flying around. He is dedicated praying his salah. And his soldiers are all looking at him. This is how he actually modeled himself in front of his army. That's why they loved him very much. Because he had high regard for Islam and Islamic values. So, Dara Shaku said in response to Aurangzeb's question that I would kill you and I would split you into pieces and hang your body parts in different parts of the empire. Very honestly, he said that to him, even though he was a prisoner, because he knew that Aurangzeb knows he would exactly, he would do exactly that. And then Aurangzeb, of course, followed suit and, and executed him and buried him next to his great-grandfather Hamayun in the tomb of Hamayun. So the other brother Murad was killed. And Shuja was lost. He went. So Aurangzeb became the emperor in 1658 to govern India as uh, the sole emperor. Now his task was to maintain order and he did his best. I cannot give you the details in this short lecture. Uh, but he became the most powerful king India ever 
experienced or witnessed. Okay, um, he had conquered by the end of his life 95% of India, the largest chunk of land ever governed by one Muslim king in the entire history or by any king in the entire Muslim history. Sorry, the entire history of India. 95% of India, he had conquered land as far as Tamil Nadu by the time he died. Uh, and this stretch of the empire actually became a detriment because his resources and his forces were stretched to the farthest end of the Indian Peninsula, he was weakened because of that. It was only the matter of time someone was to hit a weak point and the empire would start to crumble without a strong leader. So Aurangzeb was a very strong leader, of course, no doubt. He lived uh, for 88 years. Uh, he died in 1707, uh, actually 89 years, um, and he governed with iron fist. He was a soft man, no doubt, but he did not forgive rebellions from his family. He did not forgive his family. He forgave his generals occasionally, his dignitaries or his mansabdars, but he did not forgive his family. For example, one of his sons called Akbar, uh, who was sent to crush a rebellion, uh, a Rajput rebellion, um, when he went there, he crushed the rebellion, but then he declared himself to be the king on top of his father. So Aurangzeb was furious, he sent an army after him, and then Akbar was uh, hounded within India for a very long time, and then he escaped to Persia. Persia would be a very uh, you know, convenient refuge for Mughal princes and Mughal fugitives, because Persians would happily, being Shia, at the time, would happily receive uh, dissenters from Mughal India in case they can be used uh, as puppets, like the British uh, Empire did for a very long time, and the British are doing to this day. A lot of the dissenters from different countries, they find political asylum where? In? Where? In Britain. You know Altaf Hussain? Yes? You know Altaf Hussain? Who knows him? Who knows the Qayyid? He lives very close to me, by the way. Altaf Hussain is a mass murderer. Everyone knows that in Pakistan. He's a mass murderer. Okay? He has killed hundreds of thousands of people, indirectly, and directly possibly thousands of people. Okay? And he uh, led a nationalist movement called the Muhajir movement. Right? And he found political asylum in Britain. Despite all those crimes committed by him. He was given asylum here and he is still here. He is still living in Britain and uh, you know he has no serious problems living here. So the issue is likewise Persians would give refuge to any Mughal emperor on the run or a prince on the run so that they can use him for the future. And Persians were against the Mughal emperor. Mughals were Sunnis. The Persians were Shia. right? And there was antagonism between both empires. The Persians, the Safavis were very powerful, immensely powerful. At the same time, Mughals were very powerful. Mughals had the gold of India. The Mughals had the power, the strength, despite its diversity of India. Right? The Persians um, were also very powerful, but they, they never had the guts to invade India. But what they did was, they invaded occasionally Afghanistan, because even Afghanistan was governed by the Mughals, right? Up to Kabul, Kandahar, this was all under Mughals. You will see coins from Jahangir's time and Shah Jahan's time and even Aurangzeb's time, coins minted in Kabul and Kandahar, cities like that. Kandahar was, of course, lost to uh, Persians uh, in the time of um, Shah Jahan, and Shah Jahan tried to take it back, and Aurangzeb was one of those people who tried hard and successfully to take it back from Persians, he was not able to do it. So, uh, Persians were also important players. That's why Akbar, Aurangzeb's son, when he rebelled, was given refuge in Persia. So, Aurangzeb never forgave him. Never. He died in Persia in 1704, three years before his father died. Akbar, he spent the rest of his life uh, in Persia. Never came back to India. Likewise, other sons of his or grandsons, if they made a mistake, something that threatened the stability of the state, 
he would he was ruthless at other times aurangzeb alamgir crushed rebellions ruthlessly he was doing the job of a good indian king in his times you see a lot of the people now criticize kings of that time for doing what they did and they apply modern secular liberal standards to those kings but they didn't live in this age they were not ruled by these conventions or these norms or these sentiments right imagine aurangzeb was to catch rebels and instead of making them an example he would say oh this poor man he's going to be in pain you know and then all these human rights organization come along and they say no 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 you you have to put him on trial give him justice da, 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 da. none of that existed at the time kings had to make examples out of rebels and this is exactly what a good king would do and if a king who was soft and weak would be seen um as a sitting duck he would be a fair game you know he would be attacked very soon others would start to rip. so every time a rebel or a rebellion was crushed it was crushed severely to make an example out of them and this is exactly what happened to guru teg bahadur the ninth guru of the sikhs every sikh you talk to mention the word aurangzeb they will know him have you had this experience yes yes or no yes every sikh uh you know for example like the shia every shia person you talk to they will know the name name yazid yes yes or no yes yazid muawiya yes they know these names because they see them as arc enemies of the the ahlul bayt likewise when you spoke speak to a sikh person when you mention aurangzeb aurangzeb is yazid to the sikhs or firaun to the sikhs because he killed the ninth guru and the 10th guru was also uh fought by the mogul armies and two of his sons died in war and the sikhs blame aurangzeb alamgir directly because he was the emperor and the governor of sarhind who was the governor his name was wazir khan but if you look at the other side of the coin from the mogul perspective the king was simply crushing rebellions teg bahadur the ninth guru of the sikhs was devastating the punjab he was devastating villages he was devastating the countryside he was creating chaos he was killing people including muslims in many of the punjabi villages and the sikh version goes that he was fighting for the rights of the um kashmiri pandits because they were being forced into islam and the guru teg bahadur stood up for their rights and that's why he was killed but that's not the truth the truth historically actually that stuff is very difficult to establish these are narratives created very late by the sikhs later on sent i mean uh, almost a century later these stories were made up and they were made popular like you know the stories of karbala have you ever been to have you ever been to a, a sitting in muharram or have you ever watched it on tv how the shia zakirin the shia storytellers they talk about the story of karbala what happened and they have so many details they have so many details that abbas did this hussein said this Zainab cried and she said this. Yes? Sakina said this. They have so many narratives, so many details as if there were clerks working continuously taking notes standing next to them in war. Yeah, she said this, I'll note this. She said this, I'll note this. She said this, I'll note this. So much discussion and dialogue between individuals in the middle of the battle. Impossible. Any historian with two brain cells would know that this is all made up this cannot and in, in fact when you do dig deeper you come to realize that these stories don't actually reach the actual source they are just dubious stories told by people later on there is very little authentically known about what exactly happened in the battle of karbala we do know hussein radiyallahu anhu was killed we do know he was oppressed We do know the mujrims killed him. We do know the names of the people, but we don't know the dialogues 
the discussions they were having between each other, we don't have those details from authentic sources. Likewise, the Sikhs have these stories, these narratives, that the grandmother was talking to the grandsons in this way, and they said this, and they said that, and the details are so many that anyone thinking, hold on a second, can this story be true? Where did the details come from? What is the source? And when you dig deeper, the source is not there. It, it doesn't reach the actual uh, you know, person it is attributed to. So Aurangzeb is maligned by the Sikhs for this reason, but he was doing the job of a king. He was doing exactly what was required of him. Punjab was his region. He governed it. He had to maintain peace on the roads so people are not being robbed like the Sikhs were doing. Later on, Sikh rebellions, they uh, took such an intense form that the Sikhs were robbing, burning, pillaging Muslim villages at will. There was... Um, a Sikh rebel called Banda Singh Bahadur, who was eventually killed by an emperor later on called Farukh Seyar. Uh, he was uh, ravaging the Muslim villages and Muslim regions. So, uh, um, we'll pause for a second. I hope you guys are not getting bored. So, Aurangzeb Alangir is maligned for that reason by the Sikhs that because the ninth Guru was killed and the tenth Guru was on the run and he was also hunted down. But eventually we have historical sources that he actually uh, sought pardon from the Emperor and Aurangzeb let him go. Okay, fine. You want to come to terms? You want to behave yourself? No problem. Go ahead, behave yourself. No problem. You see the Sikh Gurus were not as significant as they are today. At that time, uh, they became important to Sikhs later on, right? And this is why you don't even find them mentioned in the Mughal sources. They were just insignificant rebels uh, doing rebellions in the Punjab. Mughal state was concerned about bigger issues like the Marathas in the south. So, that is one thing. Then Aurangzeb's anti-Hindu policy. Was he an anti-Hindu king? No, he was not. He was not. Because when you look at his state, he had uh, Hindu generals, Hindu treasurers, uh, finance minister was Hindu. Okay, uh, there were Hindu dignitaries, Rajputs who uh, owned the, the land of Mewar and Marwar. Uh, these two in, in Rajasthan today, you know the area called Rajasthan. Uh, this was governed by the Rajputs and they were given uh, high positions in the state. And, you know, how the Mughal mansabs worked is another question altogether, but I don't want to complicate things too much. I want to keep it simple. They would be uh, counted by how, the amount of um, military men a person would be given by the state. For example, uh, there would be Panj Hazaris in, in Persian language, the, the one who has a, a force of 5,000 cavalry or 10,000 cavalry or 15,000 cavalry or 20,000 cavalry. So their rank would be raised by the amount of cavaliers they would have in the, in the forces. So a lot of the Hindu generals or rulers or rajas who were uh, vessel states working within the Mughal Empire were given high positions by Aurangzeb. As I said, 31% of the Mughal dignitaries in the time of Aurangzeb were Hindus. In fact, during the war of succession, when four brothers fought each other, during that war, 23 Hindu generals or Rajas sided with Dara Shuku, 21 sided with Aurangzeb. If Aurangzeb was a religious bigot, as the Hindu nationalists claim today, why would 21 Rajas, important Hindu figures within India, side with Aurangzeb and fight for him and kill and die for him? Can you imagine Hindu forces, Rajputs and Marathas fighting for Aurangzeb and dying for him? So, there is a reason for this current hatred. One of the reasons is the story of Shivaji. Shivaji was a Maratha figure from the south of India who had resisted Mughal uh, power in the south and he had rebelled against the Mughals and he was taking forts and he was troubling the Mughal army. Uh, he uh, pursued guerrilla tactics and Mughals were obviously pursuing conventional military 
uh, style of invasion of the south. So uh, he was harassing the Mughals for a very long time. Even at that time, he was not as significant as, as he became later on to the Hindu nationalists. Uh, Shivaji died soon after and his son Samaji who continued and he was arrested and he was executed by the orders of Aurangzeb. So the hatred for Aurangzeb is there because of the rebellion of Shivaji and Shivaji has been turned into something he was not. Right? You see a lot of these extremist Hindus who are in India today, Hindu nationalists in particular, they make up stories. And they inflate the stories and they treat it as history. They treat it as history. And they spread these lies in the name of history. This is why they hate historians like Audrey Trush. And there are others who are writing on Aurangzeb. Some have simply shut their mouths in India. They don't want to die. They don't want to kill. They don't want to get killed. That's why they don't talk in history anymore. Some of the major authorities in history in India, they don't open their mouths anymore. They are not publishing on these sensitive matters. This woman is truly brave who has published this book and literally put her life in danger and she has uh, the audacity to even travel to India and lecture on Aurangzeb. Yesterday, the day before, the day before yesterday she was lecturing. Go and check her on Twitter, Audrey Trush. You can look at the book afterwards when, you, when I'm finished, inshallah ta'ala. So Aurangzeb was a very Muslim king. He penned Qur'ans in his own hands and he, according to some reports, made caps with his own hands and he sold them for living. But I don't know how true these stories are, but he did pen Qur'ans in his own hand. At least two to three copies were penned by him uh, within his lifetime and uh, he would pray diligently. He was a very, very pious Muslim, no doubt, personally, he was a very pious Muslim. Uh, we don't know how Muslim he was as a king. Uh, was he a good Muslim king or not is another question. He did impose jizya in 1675 or 1676. 1676, he imposed jizya because of the Rajput rebellion. Rajputs rebelled against him. Rajputs were a very powerful, strong entity within India who represented uh, Hindu power at the time. And uh, they were mainly Mughal vessels. They worked with the Mughals at times when they found them to be weak. They did rebel. And a rebellion was taking place in 1670s. And as, uh, um, uh, as an opposing gesture, uh, Aurangzeb Alamgir imposed jizya. And jizya was not, of course, collected widespread in India. It wasn't successfully collected always, but he did impose jizya. And this is one of the reasons cited by a right-wing Hindu nationalist that he imposed jizya. But jizya was there in the, in the time of Akbar. Akbar lifted jizya when he apostatized. He lifted jizya and he imposed other tax, taxes on Hindus. Amazingly, jizya was less than other taxes imposed by Akbar on Hindu pilgrim pilgrim uh, sites. But Aurangzeb came to power, when he came to power in 1670s, he imposed jizya and he removed all those taxes. And this affected the Mughal treasury daily. This costed the Mughal treasury daily because he was getting hundreds of thousands of rupees uh, every uh, month from these pilgrim sites. And I'll show you what a Mughal rupee looked like. I have one with me today so that you can all have a look. And it belongs to Aurangzeb. And we will put it on screen. Uh, pounds have come out, sorry. Uh, but I hope, I hope it's there. Um, I did put it um, uh, in my pocket. And I hope I haven't lost it. It seems. You see, I have a principle that when you find some, when you look for something, uh, you never find it. Sorry, seems to have been lost. I'll look for it later. And if I find it, I'll show it to you. Uh, maybe it's in the other pocket. Actually, it might be in this pocket. I do apologize for the... Yeah, I did bring one with me. <laughs> but I cannot find it now. But Mughal Rupee was simply... Um, 11 grams of silver found it okay this is a rupee minted during the Aurangzeb period it is pure silver 
11.4 grams of silver. This is the Mughal rupee. And this was minted in a city, city called Thatta. Thatta is in Sindh, uh, in current day Pakistan. And that was a very big Mughal center uh, of power. And um, it was a huge uh, city at the time. And this is a coin minted during the reign of Aurangzeb. It has the name of the king, Aurangzeb Alamgir. Okay, it says, uh, yeah. So you can have a look at it afterwards. Uh, you want to have a look now? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Okay. So what happened, um, the jizya he imposed actually caused more loss to the treasury than benefit. But he did it because he saw it as an Islamic duty, as a Muslim king. At the same time, there were strategic reasons for it, to punish the Rajputs for their rebellion. And he imposed the jizya as a discriminatory, possibly discriminatory uh, measure. Uh, it is very possible he did that for a reason, I'm not too sure. Uh, plus also to win the ulama over to his cause, which, were, which was already done during the war of succession. Ulama were with him. Also, in 16... 68 Aurangzeb started another project and a project he is very little known for unfortunately even within the Islamic circles are there any Hanafi brothers here Hanafi brothers Hanafi brothers put your hands up why are you hes hesitant okay brothers I uh, let me ask you you know what is the largest compendium of the Hanafi fiqh, the largest collection of Hanafi opinions on jurisprudential matters. Fatawa? Fatawa Alamgiriya. Yes? Why is it called Alamgiriya? That literally translated means rulings of Alamgir. But they're not Alamgir. Aurangzeb was his name and Alamgir, the word Caesar. The word Caesar was his title and he literally seized the world. You know, he governed 95% of India. So that was one of his greatest service, uh, one of his greatest services to the Hanafi fiqh in particular and to Islam in general. Okay, the compilation of Fatawa Alamgiriya. Okay, I know the Salafis and the Ahlul Hadith do not agree with that fiqh. I know that. Okay, but it is the greatest um, achievement as far as the Hanafi school of thought is concerned uh, this collection of fatawa out outdid the previous collections of hanafi fatawas like fatawas like fatara, fatawa kazi khan fatawa tatar khania there were other fatawas but they were smaller in uh, uh, in uh, in length but this was a very huge compilation it took um, a number of ulama Dozens of ulama, seven years to complete it. The project was started at the behest of the emperor in 1668 and it took seven years, but it was completed by 1675. Uh, the Fatawa Alamgiri was complete as a project and it contains rulings uh, from the Hanafi viewpoint on different matters. It is basically law. It is law. And this collection then was sent to Qadat Qazis all over India to govern by this law. So they would rule, especially in Muslim affairs, looking at Fatawa Alamgiri. And it is the largest collection of Hanafi fiqh opinions in the world to date. It is very big, depending on who publishes it. It runs into volumes, right? Um, so that was one of his achievements. And amazingly, one of the scholars who was very, very well appreciated and uh, well known called Shah Waliullah ad dehlawi who lived in the 18th century, uh, who was born when Aurangzeb was still alive. Shah Waliullah was born in 1704, Aurangzeb died in 1707. Shah Waliullah's father, Shah Abdur Rahim, was one of the scholars who was actively involved, reluctantly, albeit reluctantly, in the compilation of this fatawa. Uh, the reason why he was reluctant was because he didn't like to be too close to the state. Uh, he was a pious man, was down to earth, he didn't want to be too close to the king, but uh, 
when the king Aurangzeb asked him to take part because he was a renowned scholar, uh, Shah Abd Rahim, the father of Shah Waliullah, when he was asked by the king to take part, he refused to take part. But then his mother, Shah Abd Rahim's mother, she encouraged him and said, it is a good deed, you should take part and ignore um, uh, the state affairs and you don't have to get involved in the state too much. And then he took part. So Fatawa Alam Giriya was uh, uh, completed uh, that way. And then the same man had a son called Shah Waliullah later on who became a great scholar. Also another great service of Aurangzeb to Islam, which will never be forgotten, which will remain until the day of judgment, I believe, is apart from Fatawa Alam Giri is what? Anyone? Any guesses? Who wants to guess? Where's my coin gone? <laughs> it's disappeared. <laughs> no, no, it's just okay. So, um, any guesses? Who's been to Lahore? Put your hands up. Yeah. Now everyone woke up. Badshahi Mosque. You, when you enter Lahore from the old road, not from the motorway, from the old road, the first thing that hits you and, you know, you are struck by a sense of awe. It is so wonderful. It is so powerful, the sight. The sight of the Badshahi Mosque, the famous, literally translated, the King's Mosque or the Royal Mosque. It was built by Aurangzeb Alamgir's orders. It was built in 1670s, of course. It took a few years for it to be completed. And the name of the king, Aurangzeb Alamgir, is written at the gate um, uh, on uh, marble um, uh, plaques. And this was the largest mosque in the world. This was the largest mosque in the world at the time. Of course, now we have bigger mosques today. But at the time, in the 17th century, it was the largest masjid in the world. And it is an absolutely amazing sight. You have to go and look at it to understand what I'm talking about. The artwork, the, the, the strength of the Muslim civilization in India, and... The sense, you, know, you have to take your children to it. If you go to Pakistan next, go and take your children to Lahore and show them the Badshahi Mosque and explain to them how it was made and who made it and why it was made. And they will never forget it. You want your children to admire Islam and its history, then you must show them the achievements of Islam and Muslims. That's when they will actually start to understand what Islam has achieved in the past. This was a huge achievement on the part of Aurangzeb Alamgir. Rahmatullah So he surpassed, uh, if not equaled, his father in building monuments uh, when he had sanctioned this particular masjid. And this was a great achievement for Islam and Muslims in India. Other achievements of Aurangzeb Alamgir is uh, providing patronage to ulama. He supported ulama and this was the golden age of Islam and Muslims in India. The amount of manuscripts penned during the time of Aurangzeb is immense. So many Qur'ans, I personally own copies, uh, handwritten copies from that period uh, and where the scribe would write at the end that this particular copy was transcribed in the such and such year of the reign of Aurangzeb Alamgir, uh, the, the blessed king or the... the, the the great king or whatever the titles were, okay, and the date would be there and the place of writing or uh, transcribing the Quran would be, would be there. And then there are other compendiums like uh, books written on fiqh, on hadith, tafasir, okay, shuruhat on hadith. A, a great scholar called Abdul Haq Muhaddis Dehlavi rahmatullah uh, was born during the reign of Akbar and died in the reign of Aurangzeb Alamgir, had written commentaries on Mishkat, um, on Bukhari, for example, and some of them I own myself personally, in my personal library, I have the manuscripts from that period where the King Aurangzeb is mentioned. Even Hindus were writing books in Persian. I have a manuscript in my personal library, in my position, where a Hindu called Ram Singh has transcribed a manuscript on uh, the, the Muslim pious figures from India. Some of the pious figures 
you know those big shrines in India nowadays, Moinuddin Chishti and Nizamuddin Awliya and uh, Sayyid, Sayyid Ali Hijwari in, in Lahore and these people, they were very much venerated in India at the time. India was predominantly Sufi, Hanafi Sufi at the time until things started to change in the 18th century after the writings of Shah Waliullah and then in the 19th century things moved further towards uh, uh, drifting away into Ahlul Hadith movement came, became very prominent in the 19th century and many thousands of Muslims became Ahlul Hadith uh, because they found uh, that way to be closer to the Sunnah. This, this was their view, of course. Um, so at that time, at Aurangzeb's time, India was very much Sufi Hanafi and Aurangzeb himself was very much a Sufi king. He was like, you know, he had uh, Sufi inclinations and you couldn't expect any better from him. You know why? Because that's all there was in India. That was the Islam of India. Even the Muhaddisin who were writing commentaries on uh, Bukhari and uh, Mishkat and...